Hi everyone, I am Subhash Gatade. I am uh, part of a new socialist initiative and I welcome you all for this uh, inaugural lecture in the Democracy Dialogue series. Uh, I am extremely thankful to Professor Subhash Parashikar who readily agreed to, uh, for this lecture despite his uh, busy schedule and uh, he will be enlightening us about trajectory of Indian democracy and its contemporary challenges. Uh, Professor Suhas Palshikar is known uh, all over India through his Indian Express column uh, as a public intellectual who has the courage to speak truth to power. But and earlier he was with uh, Pune University, Professor of Political Science. And now at present he is an editor of a journal and also he manages the CSDS election program that studies he manages. And he has many books to his credit. The most interesting thing about uh, Professor Suhas Palshikar is that uh, he writes in, in Marathi uh, as well. So he has many books to create in Marathi also. So he's a, uh, one of the few uh, public intellectuals who is, a, is bilingual. Uh, and uh, he, uh, this, uh, uh, before I invite uh, Professor Palshikar, I would just like to tell you about this uh, series, Democracy Dialogue series. Uh, uh, we feel that is this we we are starting this series, this inaugural lecture, and uh, this is part of the ongoing conversation uh, among activist circles as well as academic circles about the fate of democracy, which 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 is there, which is facing challenges. The democracy has spread uh, tremendously, but simultaneously you are witnessing emergence of uh, right wing and fascist fascist forces. So we are facing a real dilemma about what what is what what is to be done with this democracy. How how should progressive forces uh, look at the question and how what are the tools with us with which we can fight? We can continue this uh, uh, fight. Uh, this is the inaugural lecture in the series, and uh, we continue to uh, to continue this. We have these lectures. Uh, we'll be calling up scholars as well as activists and those who are interested that they, they be updated about this series, then please uh, give your contact details or email address on the chat box. Secondly, uh, we'll be having a question answer session also after Professor uh, Palchika's lecture. So your queries also you please uh, share on chat box. I once again welcome Professor Suhas Palchikar and I and, and thank him for that. Please welcome Professor Suhas Palchikar. Thank you. Thank you, Subhashji. Uh, before we begin, I saw a couple of chats saying that they can't hear. So uh, might be just better if you make sure that everyone has uh, their uh, their uh, system working. But uh, all the same, thank you very much all of you for uh, making it convenient to attend this uh, lecture this afternoon. Uh, these are tough times that we are going through. New experiments are being made and this lecture through Zoom and Facebook Live is one such experiment where we can connect to each other despite the odds uh, that currently uh, trouble us. Uh, let me begin with a couple of prefatory uh, notes, one on a personal and the other on the question of the current moment. Uh, the personal note is that some of the things that I'm going to say today uh, actually originated in a short track that I wrote in 2017 on Indian democracy. When I was writing the conclusions and then the preface to that tract, I realized that Indian democracy was already changing by the time I had written it. And therefore, some of the issues that I flagged there, uh, I thought I should take them up here for further elaboration and maybe benefit from the discussion that we would have subsequently after my lecture. Uh, the note about the current moment is that some of us would be definitely intrigued by the pandemic and its likely effect on overall public life and democracy in general. But I will not touch that aspect much this evening for the simple reason that in my April uh, articles in the Indian Express, I have already talked about how this entire experiment of lockdown actually hurts the very idea of what is public, how the public is constituted, and therefore globally, not just in India, hurts the way democracy is understood and practiced. 
so we will we'll touch upon it passingly but except for this i will not get into these issues so then uh, let us begin with just a note of caution when we talk of democracy because all of us who are democrats who are interested in progressive uh, democratic forces gaining ground it is sometimes there is a tendency to believe that there is a linear progression of democracy one suspects however by looking at the actual experience of democracies across the globe that democracies are not necessarily moving in a linear fashion they always face ups and downs and what is even more curious is that you cannot rest assured that once you have installed democracy it would be there always democracy needs tending democracy अर्धा चेहरा दिसत नाही म्हणजे वरचा दिसत नाही काहीतरी हा राईट दॅट दॅट्स फाईन दॅट्स फाईन या सॉरी सॉरी फॉर इंटरप्टिंग बट दिस इज फाईन नाव यू कॅन वी कॅन बी सीन या या सुहास जी सॉरी मॅने आपको शायद गलती से म्यूट कर दिया आप आप म्यूट कर लीजिए सॉरी या 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 आई एम सॉरी फॉर दैट अगेन दीज आर वन ऑफ द न्यू ट्रिक्स ऑफ द ट्रेड दैट यू आर लर्निंग as you start practicing it so i'm sorry about that and let's resume uh, what i was saying was that uh, when we talk of democracy as an idea uh, there are at least three tensions involved in the idea the first tension begins with the question of what is the demos who are these people that one is talking about and we know that in every society while this question looks very innocuous naive there are actually exclusions one tends to imagine the demos by either excluding the migrants or excluding the people on the margins or excluding the minorities and so on and so forth and therefore while democracy seems to be a straightforward package that it is about the people who these people are is one irritant that always faces the practitioner of democracy the second irritant is what do these people do and there also again we find that there is always this tussle between what the people should be doing because on the one hand in democratic theory and some of you might be knowing this already so forgive me for repeating it in democratic theory there is a lot of emphasis on initiative and participation or action by the people but at the same time we also know that governments all over the world would insist instead on people responding to governments responding to authorities and therefore a certain emphasis on obedience is always there now ironically while passive citizenship means that democracy is muted active citizenship ipso facto does not guarantee that democracy would be lively so there is much to democracy than merely having an active citizen but this activity passivity dilemma is the other tension that all democracies often face and then the third is the ordering of the principles and again as i mentioned this principles ordering question you will realize why i am mentioning this since it is relevant to our own present circumstance often both in intellectual circles but more so in official governmental circles there is a certain certain ordering of the principles for example some of us would like to have rights at the top priority rights of the individuals rights of communities etc etc on the other hand there would always be some argument in favor of what is called law and order and that is always there that law and order is necessary even an argument could be made partly validly that unless there is law and order we would be in a hobbesian situation and therefore your rights don't matter if there is no law and order and our argument is weighty but at the same time you will realize that it has political connotation which reverberates in all non democratic and sub democratic regimes so this was by way of just a teaser as to what and how one should be looking at the issues pertaining to democracy but since we are going to talk more about india's democracy 
I would be now speaking more about how India has evolved its democracy and what ails, what challenges India's democracy more contemporarily. There is a famous European and North Atlantic contrast to how democracy arrived in India. And let us be aware of this contrast when we talk of India's democracy. In North Atlantic societies, democracy arrived mainly by first constructing the idea of the individual from the feudal society and from the breakdown of the feudal society the idea of the individual was uh, was constructed and once it was constructed from these individuals the idea of the people was subsequently constructed so individuals come first people as a group, the community, the society come later. There is an advantage in this kind of an ordering. The advantage is that if you order it in this fashion, then individual dignity and rights of the individual always become the bedrock of that political process. In India, however, the ordering was not necessarily this, the ordering was probably reversed in Indian context. And since I come from Maharashtra, I would take the famous dichotomous examples from Maharashtra, but I guess they are relevant to our all India experience as well. Tilak and Fule are the two contrasting examples in the Indian context. In the 19th century, Fule begins with this idea of individual dignity and individual rights. However, soon the Tirkite and other kinds of politics overtake this and instead the people were constructed as a nation and through constructing the people then the national movement sort of was unleashed. Now, I'm not saying necessarily that this ordering that individual should be constructed first and people should be constructed later is the right way of going about it. What I'm pointing out is that therefore, in the Indian context, the trajectory is different from say US or North America or Europe in general. This is important to remember because we always lament that in the Indian context, the value of liberalism is always understated. People don't understand the importance of liberalism, etc., etc. I guess while our lament may be valid, this ordering needs to be kept in mind that India's democratic politics actually evolved through a different trajectory and therefore the task like, for example, the task that the constitution imposes upon us is to both protect the people, but also then to enrich the idea of the individual. That is something that comes later. And that is something as a challenge thrown to us in 1950 by the constitution. There is another way in which the arrival of democracy in the Indian context is different from many other examples elsewhere. And it is that like many societies, India or Indian society is also made up of many groups. There is diversity in India, something elementary known to all of us. However, how does one deal with this question of diversity was an important question throughout the national struggle and at the time of the making of the constitution. And there again, the Indian answer has been historically different and ambitious as compared to Europe and the United States. In Europe, it so happened coincidentally that most of their democratic polities soon adopted what can roughly be called as nuclear homogeneity. So they became homogeneous and therefore they are happy or at least were happy till they discovered that there is a problem in their societies about multicultural challenges. So nuclear homogeneity was their route to handling the question. The American route, North American route, the US route in particular, 
has been famously known as the melting pot route where you have a kind of homogenized plurality so there is pluralism but there is americanism above and up up of everything else the indian experiment which was visualized through the national struggle and which was formalized through the indian constitution probably thought that we would chart a different course altogether and this is where i variously described somewhat clumsily described as a ambition where we would retain our diversity and yet achieve unity the term unity in diversity is not a very appropriate term so let us not get into that terminology but unity and diversity or unity with diversity was definitely the ambition to wit simply what the national struggle and india's constitution says is this that in order to be an indian you do not have to give up any of your other identities whoever you are you are you continue to be that and then you also attain you contribute to subscribe to being the indian also it is this challenge and remember this was a challenge this was not something that was achieved and i am going into this mundane thing precisely because of this reason that my suspicion is that many believed and many of us might believe even today that with the coming of the indian constitution this was already achieved i would believe that that was not the case it is the other way round that the indian constitution poses this as a challenge or something to be achieved later so the founding moment of 1947 1950 actually defines what we want to achieve how we want to achieve it and the task was then left to the next stage of democratic politics that opens up from the 1950 onwards or 1950s onwards as we call it the independent indian democratic politics though therefore democratic politics did not begin in 1950 an important journey within this democratic politics begins in 1950 and it is this it's not just running a democratic government it's not also only the challenge thrown up by dr ambedkar's famous speech at the closing of the constituent assembly meeting where he says that we have achieved political we have installed political democracy the challenge is now to move to social democracy etc that yes but something more than that which is that the architecture of a new india was created and then we asked ourselves whether we can really bring that into reality that was the challenge that india's democracy actually agreed to face from 1950 onwards my contention is that unfortunately from 1950 onwards much of our politics underplayed this challenge we did not stand up to that challenge always not that we gave up on that challenge not that we unsubscribe to it but at the same time we did not take any special efforts to fulfill that challenge instead as formal democracy or formal democratic governance inaugurates in india we entered into a phase of schizophrenic treatment of democracy it was schizophrenic in the sense that on the one hand we the people as the constitution says and therefore we kept celebrating the idea of the people we kept subscribing to the value of the power of the people yet at the same time in practice we also subscribe to and succumb to an imposing state authority now this dilemma in a sense is not unique to india only it is inherent in democracy but it became unique to india because in india we sort of reverse the logic of democracy the logic of democracy ordinarily should have been that we trust the people and suspect the elite it so happened in 1950s onwards 
initially in the first couple of decades that we reversed that logic and started saying that we trust our political elite but somehow we don't have enough trust in our people we suspect the people what sudipto kaviraj at one place describes as demobilization started happening you had this huge mass energy created through the national struggle and suddenly after 1947 there was this project of demobilizing the masses take them out of the political realm keep them at the threshold and in a sense mute them that was what was happening around 1950 and onwards this was not a conspiracy this was sometimes a well intentioned idea this was sometimes an inevitable consequence of moving from national movement to a democratic governance system but that is what happened and that is why the democracy that emerges through the 1950s was a much more docile democracy than both democratic theory and india's democratic ambitions actually visualize it was docile not just because people were demobilized it was also docile because as a another inevitable consequence of any modern democracy particularly like india where you have to also have development there was a focus on creating the state as the major apparatus as if the state was going to protect democracy thus the tension between state and democracy was not fully evolved fully developed in actual politics to simplify what happened therefore was that we took the state far too naively and therefore more and more power started getting vested in the state more and more, more powers get started getting taken away from the people as a result of that as you can imagine our democracy became leadership centered and there is nothing to do only with nehruvian image of leadership it became leadership centered even otherwise in the sense that when you have demobilized the masses then public participation always becomes predicated on what the leaders tell them so on the one hand you have the gandhi and nehru kind of legacy of tall leadership but notwithstanding that the additional factor was that once people were asked to stay back home now they expected a cue from the leader as to what was to be done and therefore the energy of democracy was squeezed out so this first phase which many of us particularly in contrast to the current regime would still like to appreciate as a major development of democracy also had a hidden somewhat implicit problem and that somewhat implicit problem was the naivety of believing in the system the naivety of believing in the state and the simplicity that people will have to depend upon the leaders for political cues through this as we run along in the 1960s therefore certain problems started emerging in the practice of india's democracy and they are there with us even today in fact they are now becoming more and more crucial more and more serious the first is the twin problem of violence <coughs> it's a twin problem twin problem in the sense that in the first place how to handle how to treat or how to understand private organized violence is one side of this problem the other side of the problem is how to keep state violence under control and we have not been able to handle either of these on the one hand private violence in the form of what is in government parlance called as militancy insurgency and so on and so forth keeps increasing at the same time and as a retaliation to that violence the state also becomes more and more violent and neither theoretically nor empirically we have any clear solution on this question of violence uh, the second problem that has emerged subsequently 
and through this period is that our public policy has always been unable to accommodate the interests of the most marginalized and the two most marginalized communities whose interests have generally been hoodwinked at are the adivasis and the dalits in case of these two sections of the indian society the scheduled tribes and the scheduled castes while all lip service is done legal paraphernalia is in place if you start looking at public policy you will always find that in our public policy and governance these two marginal sections and therefore logically other marginal sections also have been often sidetracked further marginalized in fact there is an amnesia when it comes to public policy there is an amnesia about the interests of these sections so that is the second problem that has arisen through our early post independence movement in the field of democracy the third which ails us even today and probably that is why i am mentioning it is our general failure to make institutions democratic and efficient we have failed to do either our institutions are neither efficient nor democratic in their functioning and that is one of the most notable failures of india's democratic experiment not just today but historically we created the constitution the constitution provides a certain institutional framework subsequently we created a number of other institutions but these institutions have never fulfilled their democratic purpose nor fulfilled their governance purpose it is this problem that arose not today not yesterday but in our first let's say quarter of a century of democratic experience since the 1950s then probably as these three critical issues started mounting we had a series of what probably could be described as decadal challenges they were not exactly decadal but almost decadal challenges to democracy starting with 1975 and in this audience i will not go into what they were but just list them because my point is something else rather than chronology chronologizing those but 1975 the national emergency 1984 the program against the six 1992 the institutional failure in protecting a disputed side despite central government assurance and state government assurance to the supreme court and finally 2002 again an organized violence against one community the anti muslim violence in gujarat now what is common and what is not common in these four is really the point which will tell us something about the problem of our democracy 1975 we always take pride in saying that at least and at last the perpetrators were politically punished that is to say the ruling party was defeated the government was defeated and ousted great however institutionally we didn't learn anything from 1975 in other words the institutional response to 1975 was negligible and i will connect this up later on when i talk up the present moment but at least one can say that in 1975 there was a political punishment for 1984 1992 and 2002 no political limited to the characters who participated perpetrated or supported those instances nothing happened and for a democracy this is far more serious than merely the incidence of emergency of 1975 because here is an instance where there is no disincentive politically it's not a question of how many people have been imprisoned it's not a question of whether trial has been committed or not it's a political question because these were political crimes against democracy and therefore my point is that if you look at these three 
you will find that there is no disincentive for doing such things and similar things so if you are a politician you can with impunity plan your political career today without fear of any political punishment for what excesses commissions omissions that your political career might involve and that is something serious about these three with this intermission of these three four challenges let me then come to the more critical historical context to our present moment today i would suggest and post facto it is always easy to suggest such things but i would suggest that we need to go back to the politics since 19 late 1980s in the 1990s and onwards to understand where we are currently today this is a politics you can say post emergency if you want to stretch it back but to simplify matters and since in political parlance 1990 is seen as a kind of moment when many things were happening i am flagging off 1989 90 as the point which constitutes the larger backdrop of our current moment this larger backdrop of politics since 1990s is in a sense full of contradictoriness it is contradictory because it is simultaneously described rightly as a period of democratic expansion on the one hand but as i would argue it is also a period of narrowing of democracy and that latter part becomes sort of visible to us only by hindsight today so we need to learn from this experience so i am not blaming those who called 1990s as a period of democratic expansion but what i am suggesting is that we need to learn a lot from this experience of the 90s why did democracy expand how did democracy expand in the 1990s the story is probably well known uh if you want at least two well known names who have told this story partially one is the phrase that yogendra yadav popularized democratic upsurge or the rise of the plebians the term which is also the title of the book by christoph jafferlo jafferlo and sanjay kumar have written a book with this title so what happens during this period from 19 84 85 onwards but more specifically from 1990 onwards are rise of the obcs which is expansion of india's democratic politics accession of dalits particularly in north india where historically they had not asserted earlier so in a sense one can say that it was a new phase in the ambedkarite dalit politics then there were so many political parties that politics suddenly becomes competitive and therefore even structurally it was interesting that politics was becoming more and more competitive fourthly there was an expansion of the voter base of india's elections not just in percentage terms but as our studies have shown it is in the 1990s when the rural the women the dalits the adivasis started voting in greater numbers than before so an expansion of the voter base took place and as christoph jafferlo has shown there was a remarkable change in the social composition of india's political elite now this one might criticize also as merely a kind of a descriptive uh, expansion of representation but all the same it was very important that for the first time in central to north india but elsewhere also a very dramatic change in the political social composition of our representatives started happening and that continues to happen as jafferlo and one of his colleagues have shown in a recent article uh, jils vernier and jafferlo have shown that that trend continues even to date in the sense one might add to this democratic expansion the consensus at least in political parties on the question of affirmative action so suddenly something that was very controversial a couple of years ago in 89 90 by 94 95 
it has become a matter of consensus among most political parties or in fact i would say all political parties including the bjp and therefore it this period is rightly called as a period of democratic expansion what however happens in this period of democratic expansion is it's contradictory and that contradictory is that while all this is happening there is also an imperceptible but today we can see it by hindsight narrowing of democracy generally this narrowing was on the question of agenda from 1990s onwards agenda setting suddenly became a function of media rather than politics itself post mandal i would say 1990 1992 1993 things were sort of in balance but post mandal media started setting the agenda it is the time when there was a boom in television channels it was a time when uh, television channels started becoming popular also and since that time the print but more than the print the electronic media setting the political agenda deciding what would be not only the headline not only the talking point in drawing rooms but actually what politicians would be talking about media started deciding this and that continues to this date so agenda setting going out of the realm of politics interestingly this ties up with what one scholar has described as depolitis depoliticization of development john harris an india scholar has written a short tract on this question of how with the coming of a new liberal economic policy setting the very politics of development disappears and development becomes a depoliticized process it ties up with that in the sense this is also a time and that is very curious when many people started participating in politics when political elites from new communities were coming into the political process politics gets denuded of its capacity to decide so politics is there politicking is there defections are there competition to become chief minister is there but what a chief minister does what politics does got curtailed depoliticized alongside that and also as a function of this development there was a rigging of the political menu and i am not using the term rigging in a conspiratorial sense it is simply that a sudden consensus emerges among political parties so while as i said a moment ago that politics becomes competitive that competition becomes vacuous because they are not competing for anything substantial this period is famously called as the period of the three m's mandal masjid and market that's the short form and again while i am using it i must also admit that this idea of three m's originates probably outside of politics and intellectual circles in media and that's the fourth m that sort of predominates all of us but anyway now what happens is that there is much sound and fury around the 1990 92 period and by 1993 94 you will find a the mandal question as i said sort of disappears because nobody is now contesting the question either of affirmative action or even for that matter the question of political share of members of the backward community the media kept laughing at lalu prasad and mulayam singh but politics and all political parties started taking politicians from backward classes seriously by 1993 94 and that's why christoph jaffer law has pointed out to this transition to the descriptive aspect of representation consensus in the sense the energy of obc politics that was emerging then was subsumed by this consensus the same is true of the so called market related controversy in intellectual circles 
that continued and continues as a matter of debate for political parties however it simply suddenly stopped generating any political debate because all parties started subscribing to it and remember this was a time when it didn't matter who is in power in delhi because everyone was in power somewhere if you were not in power in delhi you were in power in chennai or you were in power somewhere either in ahmedabad gandhinagar or you were in power in odisha and so on and so forth so all political parties wherever they got power started surreptitiously cautiously or brashly following the same logic of economic policy finally ultimately even partly at least the left front government in west bengal also again no controversy the only third issue that remained controversial was the mandir issue and where on the mandir issue there was a grand standing by everyone we know that actually the controversy was diffused because nobody was actually taking a contrarian position on these issues and this consensus was actually inaugurated by no one else but by narasimha rao himself when he had offered a solution to the ayodhya problem in 92 itself which of course was not successful that time in a sense therefore if you look at electoral party politics you will find that the menu was actually preset no difference in the menu just the difference in political parties that were operating finally this is also the period of what i have described as narrowing of democracy because however bad our elections have been historically probably post 1990 and this is ironical when session actually streamlined elections it is also the time when all elections became only money centered and big money this is not a small time politician making money out of politics etc but actually money back politics in indira gandhi's time also it was said to be there but suddenly starts becoming the politics but the long and short of therefore is that there was a considerable narrowing of our democracy while also opening up certain policy uh, democratic possibilities during this time the unwritten conclusion of this entire period is you recall, i have divided this into two phases so far the first i have clubbed into a large long post independence phase from 1952 almost late 1980s and the next from 1990 onwards if you were to ask me what is common throughout this period and what has been sort of strengthening throughout this period i would take you back to what i initially said was the challenge thrown to us by the constitution and by the national movement it was a twin challenge the challenge of now creating a strong individual citizen armored with dignity and rights the second was to handle democratically our diversity you will find that entire period of our political experience of post independence period we underplayed these challenges we ignored these challenges so today as i would say now in the latter part of my presentation these challenges are probably the challenges of indian democracy we find ourselves at a threshold where there is no political precedence when we have actually strengthened these two things we never strengthened individual liberty and dignity when we never strengthened diversity in our democratic context so they were easy prey for those who came to power subsequently and are in power currently so that takes me to the latter part of my point which is what is our current challenge in order to be schematic and without giving any labels to what the current moment or current regime is for the time being i would just place before you seven or eight 
characteristics <coughs> seven or eight characteristics that mark the current movement of our politics structurally in terms of political structure or the structure of political competition what do we see around today first unprecedented centralization in the office of the prime minister not the pmo only pmo of course always has been very powerful but in the office of the prime minister coupled with again an unprecedented personalization of authority you will find that here there is a resonance to 1975 and yet i am using the term unprecedented not because i want to be acerbic but i sincerely feel believe that in comparison to what is happening today to the structure of politics what indira gandhi did appears quite amateurish and therefore i am using this term there is a systematicness to what is happening today and therefore we need to look at this personalization of authority in the office of the prime minister as the first major characteristic the second is the decay of our federal politics not only in constitutional term not only in terms of center state relations that of course but more than that there is a complete decay suddenly of the federal advance that the 1990s had brought many federalists in india have always argued that 1990s was a time when india's federal federalism was suddenly blooming and then you find that it sort of evaporates so federal decay is the second the third which probably even doesn't require any comment is the unprecedented abdication by the judiciary again unprecedented notwithstanding what happened in adm jabalpur during the emergency and adm jabalpur today would look like at least a sincere attempt to justify what they were doing today the judiciary doesn't even have to justify its abdication and it is this judicial abdication which marks the third aspect of our structural problem in the present circumstance number 4 the beginning of the politicization of the armed forces it's just the beginning one hopes that it could be arrested but if it goes on then we would have probably contributed a new leaf to our overall crisis of democracy the next is the misuse of investigative agencies nothing new everyone has been doing it indira gandhi did it very well and today it has been happening and then there is a subordination of the entire bureaucracy again something that has happened earlier also and we are experiencing it today also so in a sense there are echoes of 1975 there is an improvement on 1975 there is a systematization of the 1975 movement again today add to this some other things that are happening in the structural realm today for example the irrelevance of political parties which is now increasing in 1975 that probably wasn't there today including the ruling party all political parties are suddenly becoming irrelevant to what is happening in the realm of politics and finally the closure of all popular resistance these are the structural aspects of our current democratic movement if you combine them together then perhaps you would agree therefore that our current movement is not merely a movement of usual challenges to democracy because you will recall i started by saying that democracy is never a kind of highway journey it gets into diversions it goes somewhere come back comes back it needs pushing that is what i said at the initial point however i suspect and i would place it before you that this is not a movement of just routine diversions in india's politics routine challenges it is a movement of hijack where does this movement of hijack take us 
I have consistently argued and many others have now been arguing the same thing. So I'm not saying that there's something extraordinary that I have argued that while these structural aspects are there that I listed, which should worry us, there are certain process related aspects of our current moment, which probably mark the current moment beyond everything else. So let me take you through these two process related aspects or characteristics of our current moment. And I would argue that unless we understand these two carefully, we would not understand what is wrong with our democracy today. Yes, the list that I gave you is of all the wrongs. And I would still say that they need to be addressed urgently. But these are the crux of the entire matter. What are these two? They are famously described as populism and majoritarianism. Western scholars particularly and scholars, Indian scholars based in West would normally flag off populism as a major challenge. I have no dispute with them. My only problem is about the language because populism is the language of global democratic discussion. So they use that language. But I would or I am going to argue that the latter challenge of majoritarianism is much more serious than the challenge of populism. And I will come to that in a minute. But let's first spend a couple of minutes on this question of populism. What is populism? Of course, Indira Gandhi was also called populist. And if you start looking around, uh, you don't have to look only in Delhi for populist leaders. They are everywhere there. So in this sense, populism in the sense has always been there and as, as an element of our politics. Conceptually, however, and I must warn those who are not from the discipline of political science that the term populism would have any number of definitions. However, a large body of scholars agrees that there are three elements which are part of populism. So there is agreement on these three and then there are many others who would add something else and so on. The three are in the first place a kind of anti-elite idea of people. Obviously, populism refers to people and popular sovereignty. But this idea is, it's not just anti-elite, but anti-something. Populism is always anti-something. So we are the people and then there are you who are the other. So populism requires, and that is the interesting point about populism, that through the discussion of populism, one actually encounters the echoes of 20th century exclusionary politics. So it is either anti-elite or it is anti-minority, sometimes even anti-poor. So that's the first element. Everyone agrees that it is anti-something. In India, particularly, it is anti-elite or that is what is suspected. The second element on which many agree, which is an element of populism, is what is called a moralistic idea of politics that politics is a warfare between good and bad, a great Mahabharat. And then there are the Kauravas to be defeated. So the war between good and bad, a moralistic, ultimate moralistic view of public and politics. So your adversary is not just your competitor, but is a bad element that needs to be defeated, cleansed. And then the third element is undermining of institutions, again, because people are supreme. So institutions are less important. In fact, institutions are seen as an obstacle in the expression of popular will. Vigilantism would quickly come to your mind as an instance of this. These are the three elements of populism. However, in last couple of years, uh, we, that is, uh, I was part of that study, the Lok Niti program of the CSDS and the Azim Premji University did a study. Part of that was tapping on this part. It was not on populism, remember, it was not a study of populism, but part of it was tapping on this question of populism. So our humble submission is that at least for the time being, there is an attraction towards populism 
but populism is not the confirmed attitude of the indian people as i said for the first anti elite people are quite anti elite or anti something anti this and anti that but for the two other elements not more than 30% people today subscribe to those whereas in the case of anti elite attitude almost half of the people subscribe to that in nutshell without getting into the nitty gritty of numbers i would argue that populism is an emerging tendency in the indian context though as a political practice it is rampant so many politicians political parties leaders would be practicing the tricks of populism in order to make themselves acceptable so the danger is there no doubt the danger is limited and also the danger is competitive in the sense that there is competitive populism it's not just one person's populism though one person seems to be extremely successful in reaping the harvest of that populism there are other populists everywhere there are populists in the sense in andhra pradesh and telangana there are populists or there is at least a populist in west bengal and so on and so forth my point is that while therefore populism is an important issue today in terms of the political process being unsettled is there any other danger and i have been arguing that majoritarianism is that other danger or other problem in the sense all of you would know that majoritarianism in the sheer number terms is always a problem in electoral or representative democracy because after all you win on numbers and nobody should grudge that at the same time when only numbers matter electoral democracy becomes electoral only kind of democracy but i am not talking about this aspect of liberal democracy or representative democracy what i would draw your attention to is the phenomenon of group or communities constituting or claiming to constitute majority and therefore claiming that they actually decide what democracy is now this group could be just a regional group or a religious group so this could be either a regional level majoritarianism but of course at the all india level there is a religious majoritarianism at play during last 25 to 30 years and here more than populism the numbers are slightly worrying when i started sort of pursuing this question in 2004 we found that one person in every three was of majoritarian tendency that is one person in three persons would say that yes in a democracy the will of the majority community matters not the will of the majority the will of the majority community matters everything should be decided by the will of this majority community three one person in every three 30% actually even less than one in three by 2015 this proportion has risen to almost half that is one person in every two now subscribes to this idea that the will of the majority community matters in public realm plus then because we it's not just what people think we one needs to also look at how politics unfolds and you will find that it is this politics that has become electorally popular and gainful in the past 6 7 years which was electorally on the ascendance earlier also then it had a setback but the politics of hindu majoritarianism has become successful in 2014 and that success is not limited to only electoral gimmicks that success is deeply connected to this popular sentiment about democracy being the will of a majority community i would submit therefore that both popular populism and majoritarianism as processes are important challenges that are on the top of the list of structural aspects of our current problem or challenge that the democracy faces i would now return to the last bit what i wanted to say so then where are we going 
where does this all take us as i said i would like to describe this moment as a moment of hijack of india's democracy so from a docile democracy as i said we inaugurated our democracy with this idea that people would be docile we are now entering probably in the phase of what can be described as a sub democratic politics while introducing this lecture uh, subhash ji used terms such as right wing and fascist these also are terms which are often employed in the debates about what are the challenges and what actually should be therefore the response to those challenges uh, time wouldn't permit us to get into semantics of all these terms but i would simply defend the term that i am using that it is a moment of sub democratic politics and i would connect it up at the end when i conclude what does this sub democratic moment tell us about ourselves about our politics about our public sphere as i said it tells us first that we have now probably slowly agreed to the idea that religious identity politics of the majority community is a valid and legitimate democratic expression so this legitimacy has been gained by this kind of politics it's not just that the party has won it's not just that they are popular it's not just that bjp has won the second election in a row it's something more than that which is that the idea that politics could be conducted on the basis of the religious identity of the majority community has gained ground and therefore what some scholars have earlier pointed out is that there is this kind of politics of the hurt sentiment of the majority community the politics today is this politics when people criticize nehru when people criticize the past of our uh, democratic experience it is because of this employment of the idea that the majority community has always been on the receiving side on the receiving end and let's not get into the factuality of it because it is not the factuality which matters it is the acceptability of a claim that matters so that's first the second is that dissent or difference of opinion is anti national again no need to elaborate we have been experiencing it many of us have experienced it at our doorsteps this argument that all difference and all dissent is anti national third and more diabolically and many of us are not aware of the argument that needs to be made against this is that consistently a theoretical argument is being made and that is that there is a prioritization of values nation comes before democracy nation comes first democracy comes later that's the argument that is being made you will recall as i said initially india's national struggle was unique because it said that nation and democracy go together so there was not a choice given it was said that unless we are democratic we can't be nationalist and our nationalism means democracy this combining of nationalism and democracy in the gandhi nehru kind of framework is something that is being now challenged not only in practice but in theory by the argument that nation comes first there is a privileging of nation democracy comes later and finally something entirely unrelated to the politics of the bjp but something that the government does very smartly is the erection the creation of a surveillance state a new state is being created where there will be surveillance as the continuous strategy of governance these things are now happening all around us in india i must also say uh, i am sure i would uh, invite the ire of some of us here that this is a cross party phenomenon if you look at these three or four things seriously no party is contesting these things 
surveillance state every party is actually adopting the surveillance mechanisms very gleefully very happily this lockdown is actually a kind of a small time experiment in creating a new surveillance state and every party is doing it everywhere they are in power and that is really the sub democratic aspect of it if it were that the bjp is the enemy it would have been very easy but the enemy is actually much more spread out everywhere in the political class in the media and in the public so we are our own enemies just to quickly summarize and put it in the global context this is also a moment of global slide down of democracy as the 21st century began initially there was this romanticism of the arab spring which quickly evaporated and since then everyone is worried about what is going to happen to democracy not just in these third rate parts of the world that we live in but also in the first rate part that they live in and particularly since the advent of trump american scholars have suddenly become aware of this problem and therefore there has also been a famous work called how democracies die this is a book that came in 2018 by stephen levitsky and daniel zibal uh, jiblat they have argued that democracy is sort of eroded from within so you don't have to go out to attack democracy democracy can be eroded from within and that is something that we in india are witnessing whether we can breach this or not is a tall order for just one lecture to argue about so i will not venture into that but i would conclude with two sort of big questions and then perhaps in the q and answers questions and answers if there is a need i would come back to this last bit once again as to what are the likely scenarios uh, to be clear i am not of the view that this can be very easily overcome so obviously the scenarios are only bad and worse so whether we can have a bad scenario or a worse scenario as far as india's democracy is concerned is the only question but to throw two big questions and also to put before you my answers to those two questions to conclude the first question would be this will there be a victory of the high ideology of exclusion in other words will india be a hindu majoritarian state not state really society i will not go into state will this ideology of exclusion will be will it be victorious my answer to this question at the moment would be that perhaps not for another decade and therefore we as supporters of democracy we as critics of the hijack of democracy probably have some breathing space still left to us that this is probably going to be a time of struggle a decade of struggle and maybe then this question would open up again the second big question then is will there be a complete taming and delegitimation of politics of resistance i suspect yes that is what we are now staring today what is staring us in our face is a complete taming and delegitimation of political active activism of political action and therefore of politics of resistance and by politics of resistance i am not talking of any revolution i am not talking of any kind of a revolutionary politics but simple acts of politics of resistance in your own domestic locality in your own party that you work in in your own cities these spaces are getting completely dried out and if they are still there they are getting delegitimized so in a sense the scenario of the sub democratic politics is that we might remain an election only democracy as some people have been arguing in the time to come and it is therefore that to the extent critique is an important step to finding solutions we need to critique the present moment we need to critique the past that produced this moment and only then probably some windows of political solutions might be visible
thank you very much for your patience and i would welcome your comments both here today but since time is limited your comments can be most uh, uh, easily passed on to me on the email i would like to expand this into a more prognostic kind of analysis of india's current democratic movement and your comments will definitely help and push me into that so thank you subhash and the national socialist initiative and thank you all